Hey there, today I'm gonna talk about rooks and how to get the most out of them. So in the opening rooks normally are hard to develop because rooks are stronger than minor pieces, than knights and bishops. That's why it is either hard to develop them or our opponent can attack them easily. For instance, if we play as white here and we try to play the move a4 to develop the rook to a3, then black can simply stop this idea with the move e5. And already black is controlling the center more than white, so this move a4 is really a waste of time. That's why normally the rook gets stronger as the game progresses and we get closer to the ending, because the rook can attack other pieces and cannot be easily attacked by minor pieces. Having said that, rooks can also be active in middle games, but we start checking some ending positions. In this position it is black to play, and we see that material is equal. We have two rooks on each side, one knight, and five pawns each. And normally you would say, okay, this is very simple position, pieces might get exchanged and it's gonna be a draw. But if we see the rooks, we see that white is already doubling on an open file, and it's ready to attack black pawns with the move rook to e7. On the other hand, this rook on h8 is definitely passive, and this rook on the 8 actually is looking at a pawn, which is a black pawn, so it's defending a pawn, so it's not doing a lot there. That's why in this position black played the very logical move, rook h to e8, in order to exchange pieces, because white pieces are getting aggressive, so black idea is to exchange pieces. So here the rook on e5 is looking quite nice because it's centralized, but on the other hand it's not attacking pawns. That's why the move rook to e7 is very logical. But here Tarash played the very precise rook takes e8 first. Because if we played the move rook e7, which is white's main, main idea to activate the rook, here black has the move rook takes e7, and after rook takes e7, black has the move rook d7. So the rook is active, but if black manages to exchange the rook, then it's going to be a draw. For instance, if white takes the rook, then black takes, and if white attacks, then black can counterattack on d3 with knight c5, for example. That's why here white took on e8 first. This is very precise play, because here if black takes the rook, then here we can exchange, and after taking on e8, we have knight f3, and we will attack this pawn. And black is not in time to counterattack on d3. That's why in the game black took with the knight, and here we see that we have this move, so we want to attack with the rook, because otherwise the rook on the open file is not doing a lot of things. We could either attack this pawn on d4, but we see that this pawn is defended, and we see that the move rook is 7 it's attacking two pawns. So normally, as a general rule, the rook on the 7th rank is great, because it's attacking a lot of pawns, so here, for instance, if black played the move g6, then h7 would be attacked, so the rook here, if, if it's stable, then it's a great piece. And on the other hand, we see that black's rook, again, is defending on d4, so it's very passive there. So here white already is dominating the position. And here the game continued after a6, knight to b3, and after b6, black wants to stop knight c5. Here white took on d4, but actually even here, since white is dominating, white probably it was even better to improve the king first with king f2, but the game continued after knight takes c4, rook, rook takes c4, rook takes c8, so white got the piece back, and after king c7, white came, came to e3, and white is a pawn up and managed to win descending, in which there are actually a lot of drawing chances, but white won the game. Here we have another position, and again, material is equal, but we see that black has a huge advantage, also from the practical point of view, white doesn't have clear plans, and black does. So this rook on d4, and the rook on d8, they are attacking on d3, and also this, this pawn on d4 is being attacked. For instance, if white moves the rook, then white has this idea of taking on e4, and this rook on d2 is pinned. Black has better pieces, black is attacking, so from the practical point of view, this is a huge advantage for, for black. 
And here Black continued with the move g6. By the way, Black is uh, player is Capablanca, who is a former world champion. And the idea is to play sooner or later f5. And then putting more pressure on these pawns. That's why White played the move g4 to try to stop or make this plan harder to accomplish. If White continued with king f2, Black would have continued with f5, and after let's say king e3, king f6, g3. Again, basically Black is just fi finding ways to improve his position, and White is just waiting, so it's really, really hard to play this position as White. One idea for Black is to play king g5, and prepare this idea of taking on e4, and going for this pawn ending. For instance, after a5, taking on e4 and exchanging everything. And then playing the move king g4 and going for this pawn race. Basically, black will try to promote the h pawn and white will promote the a pawn. This requires calculation, but we can see on a first sight that black is, is faster than white. So after g4, Black still continued with his plan of f5, and after, so the big threat here is taking on e4, and this pawn is pinned because Black will take the rook, and after taking on f5, taking on f5, taking on f5, here this is very good ending technique. Capablanca didn't rush with moves like e4, maybe White might try to get some counterplay with rook to e1 since the pawn is pinned. Although black is still doing very fine, Capablanca didn't rush, played the move king to f6, and now will bring the other piece to the game, which is the king. So after the move king f2, Capablanca still improved the rooks, now it's attacking h2, and after king f3, king takes f5, rook g1. Here Capablanca got the very nice trick, rook takes d3 check. By the way, when someone has a great position, it is no coincidence that he can have very nice tactical shots. And the point is that after taking on d3, e4 check, basically gets the rook back, and after king e3, rook to e3. If white tries king d4, then rook takes, and after king c5, this pawn will basically cost white the rook. That's why here white tried the move rook g3, but after taking on g3, we got this pawn ending that I won't analyze here because it's not the main topic, but basically black is faster than white, and black won the game. Finally, I want to finish with a very pretty example. This is not an ending, and we see that the rooks, white's rooks are very active. At least this rook on e1 is putting a lot of pressure on e7. Black's rooks are very miserable so far. But here white has to be a bit careful if white wants to exploit an advantage because black will try some ideas like king f7 and bring the rooks and try to exchange everything. In this case the position will be drawish. And this rook on c1 might have some ideas to come to c5 but at least this pawn on c6 is very well defended. So that's why here white played the very deep and positional move d5. So first of all, black cannot take with the with the queen because it's checkmate, the knight is pinned, so the only way to take the pawn is with the c pawn. And we see that with this move, white managed to first find a great square for the knight after knight d4, but also this rook on c1 now is extremely powerful because it can penetrate the position very quickly. And after move king f7, so black cannot castle because e7 will fall. So after move king f7, planning to play rook e8 or rook c8, white has to be uh, accurate and very quickly in his attack. Steinitz played the move knight to e6. And after rook hc8, which is the idea to exchange rooks, white played the move queen to g4. So g6 is pretty much forced, because black doesn't have time to take on c1, because after queen takes and queen f8 is checkmate. And after g6, 
Here, white find a very pretty combination, but similar to the previous example, we see that these tactical shots, they appear easily when we have a great position, so it's not coincidence, it's not, it's not a miracle. And here, Stein is playing the move knight to g5, check. So black cannot take the knight because the queen will fall. And after king e8, this is a, an excellent example of the activity of the rook, showing how powerful active rooks can be. And here it's a middle game, not an ending. White played, rook takes e7. And the rook cannot be taken. If queen takes e7, then we have rook takes and we get a lot of material advantage. And if king takes, then white gets a winning attack with rook to e1. So here I can, I'll show you some lines, but in any case we see that this king is really under a lot of attack. All the three white pieces are attacking. The king has to stay near the queen, because otherwise white will take the queen. So for instance king d8, then here we have many moves, but knight d6 is strong. And after king e7, knight e5 will basically take the queen. And then checkmate. And after king d6 we have this strong move queen to b4. Well, if the king goes to c6, we have rook c1, which is checkmate. And if we play rook to c5, we have at least rook to e6. And if the king moves, we take the, the rook and we just win. So king to f8 is uh, actually a nice trick because if white takes the queen, then rook takes c1 is checkmate. So we have to be careful about that. And here came a very amazing sequence of rook moves by Steinitz. First, he played rook to f7. And again, if we take with the queen, then we have rook takes e8. And we win a lot of material. So that's why black played king g8. There's no king to e8 because we have queen takes e7 mate. And after king to g8, again came the amazing move rook to g7. We still cannot take it because... If we take with the king, queen takes e7, we take with check. Every time we take, we take the queen with check, it's okay. If not, we lose because rook takes e1 is checkmate. And after king to h8, again, rook takes. And here, black resigned. So because if black now goes back to g8 after rook g7, if, if black goes to f8, now we have knight to h7. And if the king goes to e8, then queen takes e8 is checkmate. And if we take the rooks, same idea. And if the king goes back to h8, now we see that there is no pawn on h7, so queen h4 is check. And this will lead to a false checkmate. After king to h8, this is pretty much forced. King g7. King to e8. King g8. If black goes to d6 straight away, we have a very similar variation. King f7, king d6. And after queen takes, this is checkmate. By the way, here after rook takes h7, white who is Steinitz, another former world champion, he claimed that he saw all this checkmate in advance. So we see how amazing all this combination was. So, I want to finish summarizing a few important points. It's very important to find targets for the rooks. Normally rooks are not very well defenders. In these examples, we saw that the losing side was having passive rooks against active rooks and it was very hard to play. And secondly, don't necessarily limit this idea to endings. Normally rooks, they get better at endings, but sometimes, particularly when the rooks cannot be attacked, it's okay to activate them on earlier stages of the game.